Um, <clears throat> I'd like to welcome our uh, friends, faculty, students, and alumni to the Minnesota Institute of Astrophysics Carlos Kaufmanis Lecture. I'm Moss Kave, Interim Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. I'm pleased to, such, to see such a wonderful crowd here, even with the snow. Um, I, I guess you didn't get stuck like I almost did on Sunday, but uh, so great to have you here. I'd like to just give you a few words of introduction to the College of Science and Engineering in case it is, uh, it is new to you. Um, the college is a unique structure within, public, uh, within research universities in the U.S in combining physical sciences, mathematics, computer science, and uh, engineering, all under the same dean, under the same college. It's a tremendously interdisciplinary and, and um, integrative uh, structure to, to teach our students and to carry out research. Um, we have tremendous students. We, uh, right now, enroll about uh, 5,500 undergraduates, about 2,700 graduate students, and um, we graduate about 1,400 undergraduates, over 600 master's degrees, and over 220 PhDs a year within the college. So it is uh, really the, uh, one of the leading structures within the University of Minnesota, a uh, highly competitive college right now, tremendous students um, with, with our incoming freshman class often, actually, for the past number of years, uh, having the highest average ACT scores, for example, at the University of Minnesota, including recently in English, I must say. <laughs> well, um, the Kaufmanis Lecture is presented in memory of the beloved Professor of Astronomy, Carlos Kaufmanis, whom a number of you know, or have had as, as a teacher. He joined the University of Minnesota as a visiting lecturer in 1961, and retired as a full professor in 1978. Professor Kaufmanis was one of the university's greatest teachers. He taught more than 26,000 students in his time at the university. And he's often remembered for his very popular Star of Bethlehem lecture series. Professor Kaufmanis' enthusiasm for astronomy affected everyone who came in contact with him. And I'm, I've spoken to a few of you, and I know that was true for you. The uh, Kaufmanis lecture series brings distinguished scientists to the campus to provide public lectures on the latest hot topics, particularly in astronomy and astrophysics research. The College of Science and Engineering has a great tradition of showcasing exciting scientific research and discoveries, and tonight's lecture is no exception. I'd like to now invite my colleague, Evan Skillman, the director of the Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics, to the stage to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I'd, if we could have just another round of applause, because this is Moss's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> We, we don't get, often get opportunities to thank our dean, but there's a special thank you, Moss, for coming on your birthday to do this. Uh, normally, I like to give very short introductions, but I have, I have a couple of things I just want to share with you before I introduce our speaker. Just a, a couple of um, news things. First of all, if, if my eyes are a little bit red, it's because I just returned from a, an observing session with a large binocular telescope. You may have seen pictures of it up here. The University of Minnesota has access to the large binocular telescope through a very kind gift from Stan Hubbard, and, uh, and I was observing it, so my clock is completely 12 hours out of phase, but, um, but I'm here. Uh, there's some news items. We had uh, Keith Olive, one of our professors, was just awarded on this last weekend, and Sunday at uh, at the American Physical Society meeting, the Hans Bethe Award. Uh, we're very proud of that. There was also a, a news thing here in the slides that went by. And then many of you, I think, may have seen, because of quite a bit of attention in the news, our, our youngest professor, our most recent hire, 
Pat Kelly, has discovered a star that's 100 times more distant than any other individual star that's been seen before. And uh, Pat's sitting right there, and you can just recognize him. For, uh, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of us are happy if it's twice or three times, but Pat had to go for a hundred times bigger, so it's just uh, really remarkable. And, and the last of these, these news items, I, I, there are a number of people here in tonight's audience that have contributed to make the Kaufmanis uh, lecture possible. Um, and in particular, I have Jeff Bouchel here, who's a, an alumna, he's a PhD from the University of Minnesota in astrophysics. He, he works now in aerospace, so he's an astrophysicist who's actually a rocket scientist. Normally we get those confused, he is both. Um, and we're very grateful for his gift and also for the match by his employer, Raytheon, that has really allowed for you know, this lecture tonight. And so I'd like a round of recognition for Jeff. So. And, and, and by implication, all those who've, who've uh, donated to the Kaufmanis lecture and Carlos Kaufmanis uh, recognition, I, I you know, thank you very much for that. Um, all right, to move on to the, the very brief introduction. Uh, I, I'm just very happy. When I sent the email and asked Vicki if she would give a talk, she said yes, and I was just thrilled because um, I did not know her that well, but I you know, knew of her work and, and was, was very impressed. Um, uh, Professor Caspi was an undergraduate at McGill University in Montreal and then went to graduate school at Princeton University uh, and completed a PhD thesis on pulsar timing and, and many aspects of what you can do with these pulsars are, are these remarkable neutron stars that allow very high precision observations and she has pursued a number of different paths with that way. She then uh, went on to positions at Caltech in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and then accepted a Hubble Fellowship at Massachusetts Institute of Technology before returning back to McGill where she's been a professor ever since. Uh, she's a, a radio astronomer, by nature, but has also done a lot of observing in the x-ray regime because the things that she observes uh, demand that you do, um, you know, you use different types of telescopes to do that. Uh, she's been interested in problems from uh, localizing the neutron star to the supernova remnant and getting that coincidence which connects the two, uh, sorting out the so-called uh, pulsar zoo and understanding better these very high magnetic field uh, phenomena called magnetars. Um, neutron stars are, are uh, incredibly uh, interesting phenomena and she has put a career into that. And that was rewarded very recently by the Hertzberg Canada Gold Medal. Um, this is a, an award where the one person per year is recognized for the most distinguished in all of science and engineering in Canada. And she was uh, awarded this in uh, 2016. Um, it, and I, I think it's important to note that she was the first and only woman to receive this award. And um, you know, it's just an honor and a privilege to have her here. The, the purpose of the, I mean, the, the layout of the talk will be, uh, uh, she has about an hour's talk prepared and then uh, I'll come back up and I'll direct questions. So you'll have plenty of time to ask questions after the, tonight's talk. So if, uh, if I may lead a, a uh, Minnesota, welcome to our latest Kaufmanis lecture. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's really a, a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here and see so many people out uh, to hear about uh, uh, the topic that um, is actually a bit of a departure for me. So uh, at this point in my career, I've suddenly done a left turn, and I'm now working on uh, this new phenomenon called fast radio bursts. And uh, I guess the slide should appear uh, any second, but I'll just describe it. There we go. So this is um, uh, a cartoon to sort of orient you, give you a little intuition uh, of the phenomenon, which is something brand new that we've really only known about for the last decade. It's a total mystery. This consists of very brief, short bursts, as this sort of cartoon is meant to be um, hinting to you, uh, of radio waves that, as I'm going to explain in great detail, we know are coming from far, far outside our galaxy, but we don't know their origin. This is a big puzzle right now in astrophysics, something really brand new that we're struggling with. And as I tell you about this new phenomenon, uh, it's really uh, also an example of how 
how science gets done. It's, uh, you're gonna see along the way, as we've been trying to solve this mystery, all sorts of twists and turns and surprises, and really gets across uh, what it's like to do science quite uh, right at the forefront when you, you don't know, you, you know, we literally don't know um, uh, what, what, we ha what we have on our hands, what this, what this puzzle's all about. And you might have seen this, it's gotten quite a bit of, of press. So this was uh, uh, last January, we were, uh, our research team was on the cover of Nature, uh, where, you know, conveyed a very easily mystery object, uh, studying this fast radio burst phenomenon with uh, that kind of telescope. So um, as Evan mentioned, um, I'm a radio astronomer, we use radio telescopes, which uh, there's an example of one, that look like large satellite dishes. Um, collecting radio waves um, from the sky. And just this January, um, we made it again onto the cover, and, and here it's not quite as obvious what you're looking at, but this is actually uh, a portion of the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico, the largest radio telescope in the world, which also has made some important progress, as you're gonna hear tonight, uh, on this, this mystery, but, but fast radio bursts, they've gotten quite a bit of press, not just in highfalutin uh, science journals like Nature, but uh, they've gotten press all over the place. There's the Washington Post article about them, and uh, New York Times, the magnetic secrets of mysterious bursts, and uh, Scientific American, really all over the place. It's captured the imagination of many people. Partly, I think, uh, you hear radio, and you hear um, you know, radio signals from outer space, and some people start to think a little bit, you know, about, oh, could this be some, some message or <laughs> some signal? And, and no, we don't think that's what it is at all. Uh, but I think that's, um, uh, that's, you know, part of their intrigue. And so I want to break this problem down for you. I want you to understand what we're dealing with. Uh, so first of all, when I say fast radio bursts, let's, let's be clear. Um, you're familiar with... Um, uh, this is a radio. So when you hear radio, that's probably the first thing many people think of. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a device that is using an antenna that's capturing radio waves um, at, uh, at different radio frequencies. So you know that the, uh, this radio here has a dial. You can turn it, and you can tune into different radio stations. So I know in Montreal, for example, uh, we have a great uh, classic rock station, 97.7 megahertz. That's the, uh, that's the frequency of the radio waves for that radio station. And you can, there's a whole range of different radio frequencies, and you find narrow uh, regions where different stations are broadcasting. We call that uh, the, their bandwidth. They, they over, you could like, tune a little bit. You know, if you play with that dial, you'll hear that station over a little bit of range of radio frequency space. Uh, now, what are radio waves? What is that device capturing? Well, um, its uh, radio waves are, of course, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're just another flavor, if you like, or another really color of light. Uh, the light that you're, you're seeing me with now is what your eyes are sensitive to, optical light, which forms a small portion of a much broader spectrum of light, the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum of waves, uh, that's just a, this, this central portion. But as you change the frequencies of light, in the same way that you have red is one frequency and higher frequency is blue, um, you can go uh, shortward uh, to, to, to uh, higher frequency even than blue to the ultraviolet and on up to X-rays and gamma rays. Or you can go to um, lower radio frequencies uh, down through the infrared, past the red, to the infrared, to microwaves, and to radio. And so the radio waves that I'm talking about, it's light, just like any other kind of light. It's not, you know, we didn't evolve with, with radio eyes. If we, you know, we could have a person with nice antennas for eyes, you could see the sky, you could see radio waves everywhere. Uh, we, we have, uh, we're here. But I'm, uh, this, this, the part of the spectrum I'm talking about is the radio waves that are at very low low frequency kind of light, or equivalently a uh, long wavelength type of light. And so the fast radio bursts, for reasons we don't understand, seem right now, as far as we know, to produce uh, radio waves uh, that are in the forms of bursts. Just short flashes, and by short I mean just a few 
thousandths of a second. Just each one lasts only a brief millisecond. Uh, and they seem to be going on all over the sky. The first one was discovered um, in 2007, reported in 2007 using uh, the Parkes radio telescope. And uh, today, and I'm going to show you a picture of the Parkes radio telescope, it's in Australia. Today we know of about um, 30 of these events have been detected, a total of 30 events. But in spite of only having seen about 30 of these, we actually think they're extremely common so that we believe these short bursts are happening something like 1,000 per day if you look over the full sky. So if you could look everywhere, which is hard with a telescope, usually you're pointing in one direction, but we, from the amount of sky any one telescope can see, we can extrapolate and infer that it's a very, very common phenomenon. Uh, and as I said, their origin is, is totally unknown. Uh, we can definitely state they're not microwave ovens. And if, if that sounds bizarre to you, you'll understand in a minute why I, I say that. Um, so as I said, the, the, the first one was detected using the Parkes radio telescope. And here's a picture of the Parkes radio telescope in uh, New South Wales, Australia. This, um, this radio telescope has an aperture of 64 meters. And just for scale, that's a three-story building underneath it. And I actually did a lot of my PhD work uh, in sitting in that little building. Uh, very, uh, it's a lot of fun to, to sit there and feel the telescope move, the whole building shakes. Uh, when, if you do it just right, you have to get it just right. And, and uh, just, there's a, a road down here. If you just keep going down the road, there's a visitor's quarters where you, as an astronomer, you live there. Uh, there's uh, little rooms where you sleep, and there's a kitchen with a fridge and food where you can eat. And that's how, as astronomers, we live. Um, this is a, a popular press photo of uh, the Parkes telescope you know, detecting a fast radio burst. So this is how, uh, you, you know, if, you, if you wonder what one of these things looks like, you can't see it. So this, this, is, not a, this is a silly cartoon. They're just trying to show you that there are waves coming from a point on the sky that hit the telescope. But, but that should not be the picture. That's not how we see them. We can't see radio waves, unfortunately. So you might wonder, well, how do you know what they, what, what does it look like to you with a radio telescope? Uh, so it looks, uh, this is how it looks to us. Um, we collect the data from the antenna that's at the focus of the dish, and we digitize it and amplify it and record it on a computer. And so what we really see is if you look just at this little inset here, uh, normally we just see noise coming from the sky, nothing interesting, and you see this big blip where the uh, intensity of the radio waves uh, suddenly got very, very large, and then it disappeared. And we're back to noise, and it doesn't come back. OK, that's, that's a fast radio burst. Now, the rest of this plot is a little more complicated. I do want to explain it to you in detail. I want you to understand this is very important. So um, what we have plotted here is just like the radio dial. This is the range of radio frequencies that our antenna is sensitive to. And uh, you see we have a large large bandwidth. And in fact, you can see there's, there's this line going across here. This is time on the x-axis here. You can see a line. That's actually a radio station right there. So that's what a radio station looks like to a radio astronomer. It looks like, at a fixed frequency, uh, allow a, a large signal. And we filter that out, because that's annoying. We don't want the radio station in there. We want the sky. And it's this dark band that you see sweeping, sweeping through the band. Uh, going, arriving first, so this is time, so the signal from the sky arrives first at very high radio frequency and then comes at, at, at longer, um, at the lower radio frequencies, it takes more time to arrive. It sweeps through this band, and that's, that's a really important effect, okay? And I want to explain that effect to you, why it does this, why it doesn't just arrive at all radio frequencies at the sky at the same time. It, it, it uh, sweeps through the band. So I'm going to explain to you why we believe this does this. But first, I just want to explain to you why we call it the Lorimer burst. It's after the astronomer who first noticed it, Duncan Lorimer, a good friend. And there you can see Duncan uh, with the Parkes telescope uh, in the background. Um, now, the reason I want you to uh, understand this sweep so badly, the reason I'm going to dwell on it and explain it in, in more detail, is that um, 
it's the reason we believe this, these, these fast radio bursts are coming from far, far outside our galaxy. So you, you say, well, how do you know these flashes are coming from outside the Milky Way galaxy? How do you even know they're coming from outside our solar system? Or maybe they're even in our atmosphere. How do you know anything about, you see a flash, what do you, what, how do you know what that is? And we're, we're asserting, not only is it from far outside the Milky Way galaxy, we think it's from the farthest reaches of the observable universe. And, and so why is that? And first, let's be sure everybody's on the s same page about the scale of the universe. So, so this is, of course, uh, a cartoon of our solar system. You're familiar with this. There's the sun. Uh, there's the uh, Earth. You know, the, the planets, they're not really on rings. I don't know why they always draw those rings there. It's kind of annoying. But uh, of course, um, we are part of a large galaxy. And a large galaxy, this is, this, is, uh, this is not our galaxy. You might think I would show you a picture of our Milky Way galaxy, but, but I can't do that because we're in it. So it's very hard to take a photo of the outside of your house if you're standing inside of it. Uh, so if anybody ever shows you a picture of a galaxy and say it's the Milky Way, you say, that can't be the Milky Way. You'd have to zoom out, and that's impossible. Uh, but this is a galaxy that's a lot like our Milky Way galaxy, we believe. So if you could zoom out and take a picture, that's what it would look like. And uh, for scale, um, you are here. So the entire solar system is a, a speck way smaller than the dot that I've drawn there. Uh, my, uh, you know, something that would be, that on this scale is, is infinitesimally small, you can't even see it. But the point is that it's on the outskirts, uh, uh, in, a, in a region, in outskirts of a spiral galaxy. That's, that's roughly where we sit. And, um, and by the way, if, uh, uh, what, does, what does our galaxy look like from the inside? Uh, this is a lovely view of the center of our galaxy. Uh, seen from New Zealand, actually. From the, it turns out that the center of our galaxy is in the southern hemisphere, so it's hard, hard to see this. And, and really what we see is we're looking through the disk of the galaxy, and you see a lot of stuff in the way, actually. It's a lot of dust in our galaxy that obscures the bright light from the center of the galaxy. So this is what the disk of the galaxy looks like uh, looking right into, into the center of our galaxy. That's how we see our galaxy. Um, but just to come back to this point about the scale, when I say fast radio bursts come from the farthest reaches of the universe, what do I mean? So again, here's, if this is the Earth, and it's a little hard to see, but I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, if this is uh, the, uh, the solar system, and you can see there's a little dot there, I hope you can see it, it's red, that's, that's the Earth and the scale of the solar system. And now if you zoom out of the solar system, to the nearest stellar neighborhood, just the stars that are closest to us, the solar system is now just a speck, okay? And if you zoom out of the nearest stellar neighborhood to the scale of the Milky Way galaxy, and again, we're a speck on the edge of the galaxy. But now if you zoom out of the Milky Way galaxy so that we're in the nearest uh, local group of galaxies, so now each smudge here is a galaxy, and the uh, Milky Way is over here. You see there's a whole uh, a bunch of galaxies now. And if you zoom out of that, you get into the uh, uh, Virgo, so we call it a, a cluster of galaxies. So uh, this is now uh, uh, the, the entire local galactic group is now just a speck and the scale of the supercluster of galaxies. And this, this supercluster of galaxies is actually part of even, uh, uh, is now a speck in this scale. We've now zoomed out so that the whole supercluster is just a speck. And if you zoom out to the farthest so the scales in the universe, uh, the universe, uh, each of these, is this, each little smudge here is actually a super cluster of galaxies, and ours is just now a red speck. And this is the scale on which we think fast radio bursts are coming. Okay, so and now, that, now that, that's a quite, a, quite a, a claim. And you should always, you know, in science, you, you don't believe what you hear, you have to, you have to how do you know this? How can you make that assertion? How can you be so sure that it's coming from so far away? So let me come back to this. And this is where the sweep, how this, the, the radio signal from the burst sweeps through the radio band that we were sensitive to the telescope. This is why, how it matters. Now, we call that sweep dispersion. And dispersion, you're actually familiar with it. A very similar phenomenon is what uh, uh, is what happens when you shine a, white, a, a beam of white light through a prism. 
White light is actually composed of many colors, the colors of the rainbow. And what a prism does is it geometrically splits up. It bends the light, way, the light rays by different amounts depending on their frequency. So red bends a little bit differently from blue, so the prism breaks up the white light into many colors of the rainbow. Uh, and in fact, that's the reason for the rainbow, that sunlight, which is, which is composed of many colors, gets dispersed by water droplets in the atmosphere. And uh, if the alignment is just correct, uh, you, it, the water droplets act like little prisms. And that's why we end up seeing the sunlight spread out into its constituent colors. Um, and so, but what you might not know about dispersion, so you're probably familiar with this, uh, but what you might not know about dispersion is that it also causes a little bit of uh, some delay in the signals. So that red, not only does it get bent differently from blue, but it slows down a little bit in the, in the material. Uh, and it slows down by a different amount than blue slows down. So that if you could send a pulse of white light, you would see that the blue comes out a little faster than the red, in addition to getting bent by a different amount. And that means that the speed, the speed of the different colors is a little bit different in the prism. And you might say, well, wait a minute. Uh, a very famous gentleman who you probably know, uh, he said, the way to the speed of light, and that's this, that, that uh, you probably know, e, the famous equation E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light. That's a constant. Uh, what, what are you telling me? It's not just a good idea. It's the law. If light travels at the speed of light. How can you tell me otherwise? Well, that's true, but only in a vacuum. When light is traveling through a material, different frequencies will travel at different speeds. Um, now you might say, well, you're talking about radio waves going through space. Isn't space a vacuum? You know, why doesn't this work uh, in space? And, and space is not a vacuum. Um, space is made of, uh, uh, there, there, there is material in space, even though there's it, not a lot of it, but there are atoms in space. And in fact, uh, radio waves in particular are dispersed by free electrons. So atoms can lose electrons uh, in this cute little, little cartoon. And, where, and so there are both atoms in interstellar space and there are free electrons in interstellar space. And free electrons to radio waves are like a prism to white light. Free electrons disperse radio waves. Now, um, let me explain a little bit more. So uh, this, I'm suddenly, suddenly out of nowhere, I'm showing you a contour plot. Uh, this is a contour plot of the relief uh, of some mountainous regions in, I believe, in Maine, in the state of Maine. And why am I showing you this? I'm just reminding you what a contour plot is. A contour plot uh, uh, here, are these, these are lines of, of constant altitude. So if there's a peak over here, uh, you can see the lines are, are labeled by their altitude rel relative to sea level or something like that. And any line here, you know if you walk along that line, it's gonna be at a constant altitude. You won't be walking down or or up if you're, on, if you're following one of these lines. That's what a contour plot is. So just keep that in mind for a moment, hold that thought, and let's come back to the not Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so this is a, a spiral galaxy just like the Milky Way, a picture of it. And this is what our best model is for, actually for our Milky Way, this is a computer model where the color here is showing you the distribution, what we believe is the distribution of free electrons in our galaxy. There's lots of atoms there too, but atoms sometimes lose electrons. And we have ways of measuring the free electron content in our galaxy. And so if you can just show where these free electrons are, it sort of models the structure it, it, it goes along with the structure. You see spiral arms. There's lots of free electrons in spiral arms. There's less in between. There's a lot in the center of the galaxy. We think there might be a hole in the center of the galaxy in free electrons. We're not actually too sure about that. But the point is that we have developed a model, which you can also express as a, as a contour plot, of the distribution of free electrons in our galaxy. And so now we're looking down the, this is where the center of our galaxy would be, and you see the spiral arms are sort of in a, in a kind of funny shape there. And, and the Earth, the solar system, is up here where I'm showing you here. 
And these lines are lines of constant total numbers of free electrons. And so in any direction in our galaxy, we know roughly speaking for any distance how many free electrons there are and what the line of constant free electron uh, density is. And so I'm telling, I'm telling you this for a very important reason. The reason is that we, we know where the free electrons are in our galaxy. And in particular, we know for any direction what the maximum number of free electrons are in our galaxy. Our galaxy, you run out of material after a while, and we know in any direction from these kind of maps how many free electrons there can possibly be in that direction. And this is crucial. Uh, so this, um, so now, here's a cartoon, cute uh, cartoon. Uh, what you're going to see is a fast radio burst, and it's going to be shown as a burst of white light that then travels through the Earth, and you're meant to imagine that there's lots of free electrons here that are going to disperse it like a prism. So the idea is, go ahead, there. There's your FRB. It's white, but as it travels, the, the, the colors travel at different um, uh, speeds, and the blue arrives first at Earth compared to the red. Uh, so it's acting like a prism, um, uh, except for radio waves. And so, oh, there you go again. You can see it traveling and spreading out. That's very important. It spreads out as it travels. Right there. Uh, and so just to drive this home one last time, the different color radio waves travel at different speeds in free electrons, which we call plasma. Interstellar space is not a vacuum. These free electrons act as a prism for radio waves so that if it's emitted as a single burst at the source, it sweeps through the frequency band in the, and like, anal, like spreading out all the frequencies into different colors. And this effect will wash out short signals if you don't correct for it. Because over a short amount of time, they all arrive at different times. And, you, and so what we do is in software, we correct for the, using a computer, we correct for this delay, for this sweep. And here's the point, okay? Here's why we think fast radio bursts are coming from the furthest regions of the universe. Here's the sweep from the delay from the amount of this dispersion, we can measure the number of free electrons that have to be between us and the source. Okay, and that number in crazy, don't worry about the units, but the number is 375 in crazy astronomer units, don't worry about that. But from the maps of the galaxy that we know and have calibrated using galactic sources, we know what the maximum in that direction is for the Lorimer burst. And that maximum is 25. So we know that there's no way our galaxy has anywhere near the number of free electrons you need to get the sweep of that short, of that fast radio burst. And not only, not just by a little bit, by over a factor of 10, we're off. So it cannot be our galaxy that's doing this. And so that observation alone, when Lorimer and his colleagues in Australia with the Parkes Telescope first measured this dispersion, and they knew what direction it was, and they saw, they were, they were astonished. They said, how can this be? And it had to be extragalactic, and not just extragalactic, very extragalactic. It has to be way outside our galaxy. And that tells, told them immediately something else really important because we know of sources in our galaxy that do something like this, but if this fast radio burst is going to be far outside our galaxy, then it has to be extremely bright for us to be able to detect it at such a large distance. So it must be, it's, if it's so far away, it has to be incredibly bright. And this gave them pause. This is some sort of new phenomenon. This is, it has to be, you know, a thousand to a million times brighter than any radio bursting object that we know of or have ever studied before. But they didn't know what it was. And initially, back in 2007, 2008, they were puzzling, is this real, is this not real? There was a, a strange 
other phenomena that they measured at parks uh, around the same time. This is an example of it. They called them peritons. I don't know why they called them peritons. But the point is that they looked a lot like most of the fast radio bursts they were seeing, the standard you know, sweep through the radio band. But it looked a little strange, a little clumpy, uh, you know, sort of spread out in some places, not present in other places. Uh, it looked a little different. And they thought, uh, what is this? Why? And, and it turned out some of them looked beautiful, like the standard Lorimer burst. And some of them looked strange. And it bothered them that there seemed to be two classes. And when you don't really know what's going on, you try to plot things in different ways. And so this is what they did is they plotted all the regular ones that had smooth frequency sweeps. They pl plotted them versus time of day in Australian local time. And those are the dark gray ones. And then the weird ones, the peritons, they plotted in light gray. And they noticed something interesting that the strange ones by far seem to prefer noon. They like to come at lunchtime. So peritons occurred most often at lunchtime. And there's a highly technical term for this sort of phenomenon. It's called suspicious. <laughs> because you know, why should some astronomical phenomenon happen to know about the eating habits of humans, particularly in New South Wales, Australia? That doesn't make any sense. And what they realized is um, you know, I told you all about where I spent my PhD thesis, the road down there, the visitor center, and the kitchen, and the microwave oven in the kitchen. <laughs> they got suspicious because the microwave oven in the kitchen at the Parkes Telescope is not shielded in any way. And it turns out that a micro the microwave oven in the Parkes kitchen uh, will emit peritons, but not just any old time you have to be very impatient with your lunch. And you have to, you know, you, you, you set the microwave oven on, and then you, op they, you have to open it before it shuts itself off. So you have to open it while it's still running. And of course, it shuts itself off, but it takes a few milliseconds, it turns out, for it to shut itself off. And so they had a PhD student stand there <laughs> with, you know, with paper, make time, OK, open it, open, close. Right, right, and, and it turned out every time she did that, it produced a periton in the radio telescope. Uh, but it was confusing at first because the telescope also had to be oriented toward the visitor center. So it had to be in that general direction, and someone had to be impatient with their lunch. And that made the peritons. And um, I'll show you here. Um, so the month, the um, monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society is one of the most prestigious astrophysical journals there is. And I want to draw your attention to this paper, um, identifying the sorts of peritons at the Parkes Radio Telescope. I don't know if you can read it. I'll read it for you, this section of the abstract of the paper. It says, subsequent tests revealed that a periton can be generated at 1.4 gigahertz, the, the frequency that they were looking at, when a microwave oven door is opened prematurely and the telescope is at an appropriate relative angle. <laughs> and you know, you might wonder, you know, did this just, you know, were they embarrassed? Was it, is this a disaster for astronomy? And just the opposite. So to me, this is wonderful. This is an example of science at work. We don't understand something, and we figure it out. And if we've gotten something wrong, we announce it publicly, and we explain it to everybody in great detail. I mean, they have a chart in there of open, close, open, close, you know, and then showing that it's all in there. You want to see it. And this is how science works. And it, this is very surprising to them. And, uh, and, but I think the most important aspect is, is what they said at the end. This and other distinct observational differences between peritons and other FRBs that arrived at all at random times um, show that FRBs are excellent candidates for genuine extragalactic transients. And it was really understanding that some of them were, were not real 
and, and seeing that most of them, or, or a large fraction of them, were real. And now that phenomenon has been seen at other telescopes um, that don't have microwave ovens, um, that we believe FRBs are real and, as I explained from their dispersions, uh, at cosmological, that is, at, at very large distances. And so, you know, what are FRBs? So people ask me, so what do you work on? And I usually answer, like, I don't know. You know, <laughs> there, uh, currently, uh, there are more theories published in the literature about what these events are than there are actual events that have been dis discovered. Uh, you know, it's something making a large burst, a huge burst of energy. Uh, so you think an exploding star of some kind, supernovae perhaps, um, perhaps colliding stars. Uh, you know that we can have neutron stars, as, as you heard in the introduction, these are very compact objects. If you smash them together, you can get some really bright explosion. Maybe it's two neutron stars colliding, or, or you want to get maybe a neutron star and a black hole to collide, you know, um, or comets, asteroids impacting neutron stars. All of these are in the published literature uh, trying to explain the, um, the, how bright uh, fast radio bursts are and how common they are. Um, but the answer is we, we really, really don't know. And, you know, but we recently, so recently we've had a few more clues and I want to share them with you and that's going to take us uh, to, I promised you I would talk a little bit about the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. So this is now a, a, an aerial view. This is a, a 300 meters across, 300 meters across. So it's, I don't know, was it three football fields across, I guess? Uh, this here is a lovely three-story visitor center with a beautiful museum, a science museum. They bring Puerto Rican school kids uh, there all the time. Uh, you can see a parking lot down here. This here is a, is a catwalk. So you can, scientists and engineers can walk, walk along this and go walk up on this enormous feed structure where you could easily have, you know, 100 people roaming around up out there. Uh, this is a picture of me and a couple of my colleagues standing uh, at the top of the catwalk. Uh, where I don't know why we bother with, <laughs> with these hard hats. Like, if we fell, I, I, there's no point. I don't know. Um, and if you do zoom in, you will see our knuckles are white, because it is really scary up there. We, we, uh, but it's also a lovely view. And you might recognize this telescope from uh, um, the, major J the major motion picture uh, James Bond Goldeneye, where um, they actually pretended that this dish was in Cuba and not in Puerto Rico. It's really in Puerto Rico. And uh, I'll just tell you a, a brief story that Pierce Brosnan, who was James Bond in this movie, uh, there's a great scene in Goldeneye, if you watch it, where he's running along this catwalk, and, uh, but it's not really him, it's his stunt double, because uh, he was too scared. And so uh, I'm very proud to have done something that James Bond was too scared to do. Um, uh, uh, but in any case, uh, let me show you um, the first fast radio burst that was found not at the Parkes Telescope in Australia. This is uh, FRB, we call it 121102. We, we named them by the dates on which they arrived at Earth. So it's the same picture that I've shown you many times. This is now radio frequency and time, and you can see it sweeping through the band. It, curiously, it sort of disappears at the lower regions of the band. Um, we're actually a little less sensitive there, so we're not too surprised. And this is when you correct in software, uh, you, you align all of this up, and you sum it up, and you get a nice, nice burst, and you see the, 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 the fast radio burst list lasted a couple, couple of milliseconds. And um, this was the first, like I said, the first FRB uh, that was found uh, at an observatory other than Parks, which our Parks colleagues were delighted because they were still worried, what if it's something else at the observatory they haven't thought of? But this is a completely different software, completely different team, and we, we looked at this very carefully and uh, uh, convinced ourselves very much that it had to be real, then we detected it at other radio telescopes. And then an amazing thing happened we decided to keep observing this region of the sky just in case it came back. And Parks had been observing all their FRBs and, and nothing had ever come back. Uh, so I was a little dubious about this whole project, uh, but you know, 
Okay, I'll give it to a grad student to look at those data, even though I'm thinking eh, he's not going to find anything. Uh, but that was not the case. So the Arecibo fast radio burst decided to repeat. And this was uh, a big shock to us. So this is the original, the first burst that we detected uh, in 12-11-02, uh, 12, uh, 12, the 2nd of December 2012. And then many, many months later, and many observing sessions later, we had observed this many times, never seen anything. One day, it decided to emit another 10 bursts. These are all on the same day. Uh, we were shocked. Um, you can see some are really weak. And so now they've all been corrected for the dispersion. They're all at the exact same dispersion measure. The, the, the range of the sweep is exactly the same. So we know it's the same source. And it, th these two bursts, the one where it's super bright and then the one where it's a little less bright, these are within uh, some, less than a minute of each other. And this was, uh, we were blown away. So this was a shock. And it was actually my PhD student at McGill, Paul Schultz, uh, who made the discovery. And he, you know, he sent out an email saying, I think I might have found something interesting. And we were like, oh, we couldn't believe it. And we got lots of press over this. So you can see CBC News in Canada, the Washington Post, and all sorts of different places wrote about it. And it was immediately, like, just like, you just, 10 bursts? That throws away half the models. That throws away half the theories. It can't be, you know, neutron stars can't collide 10 times in an hour. It doesn't work that way. It can't be a supernova explosion because it was months later. I mean, immediately we eliminated, with one observation, we eliminated a whole class of models. And that was very gratifying. Uh, but the importance of this repeating event uh, was, uh, there's another, uh, so it's important because it could rule out models, but it was also important for another reason. And let me explain to you what that other reason is. Uh, we have what we call uh, a sky localization problem with radio telescopes. So here's a region of the sky. When the Parkes radio telescope sees a fast radio burst, it knows roughly where in the sky it came from. But this is the sort of scale of the uh, the size of the uncertainty region. So Parkes has pretty blurry vision, and all it can tell us is that it's in a region roughly this size. It's, it's something like a, a little less than the full moon, okay? And if you look with an optical telescope, if you go and you want to know, is there a galaxy there? Did it come from some galaxy? We know it's, not our, it's, we know it's from far outside our galaxy, but maybe it's coming from another galaxy. You'd expect that. That's where most stars are in galaxies. Uh, but the problem is, what Parkes can tell you is the region of the sky, and there's a thousand galaxies there, so you can't know which galaxy it's coming from. It's a, it's a problem. And as you go to larger radio telescopes, you actually narrow in a little better. So Arecibo, uh, its uncertainty region is smaller, but still there's a hundred galaxies there, and you, you can't know. Uh, but with a once you have a repeater, you have a hope. You have a hope. You can go to a different kind of radio tele... Oh, yeah. So this is uh, a different kind of radio telescope called the Very Large Array. It's an interferometer. I'm going to explain what that is in a moment. Uh, and uh, there's a great one in New Mexico. So if you can look with an interferometer, you can localize to a tiny region of the sky, and you can look and see, is there a galaxy there? And so once we knew we had a repeater, we could go to the people at the VLA. Here's the VLA. Uh, and we could say, hey, can we borrow your telescope and can we have a look at this region of the sky and see w if, there's a, is a, if there's a fast, uh, where the fast radio burst is coming? We know it's bursting a lot. Can we look? And they were very excited because this is a very hot topic. And they gave us time. And we looked. And the source didn't do anything. <laughs> and they gave, us they gave us quite a bit of time. And, and it, time on this kind of telescope, on an interferometer like the VLA, is is very precious. It's, everybody wants to use the interferometer. It makes fantastic images. And uh, you know, to, to just say, can we have some time? And they said, OK, here. They gave us some time. We saw nothing. We came back, and they gave us, so they gave us 10 hours. We saw nothing on the VLA. We, they, we went back and the following month. They gave us 40 hours. They said, let's really get this. The source did not cooperate. No bursts. It's very aggravating. And you know, they're going, uh, excuse me, we need our telescope back. And we're saying, just, just give us a little while longer. We're sure. Uh, and they said, OK, you can have another 10 hours. And fortunately, in, those, in, in the test, as we were setting up the observations, 
uh, just test, while we were testing uh, our, our configuration, the source went boom. It started to be active again just in that last observing session. And uh, for arcane reasons, so the, the, the circles here you're seeing are the regions we had, are the uncertainty regions from the Arecibo radio telescope. And during our observation, uh, it, it looks like a star in the observation here, but that is the signal as seen by the interferometer. Uh, we know we can localize it exactly to that tiny little point. We were able to measure with the VLA independently the same sweep, the same dispersion measure, the same amount of free electrons. We know it's exactly the same source. Uh, and that was very exciting because that, could, that allowed us to pinpoint the location very precisely. And then the next step, once we had that, we, could, we want to then, is there a galaxy there? So then we have to go to our friends. Yeah, so here uh, we caught, and in fact, it didn't just burst once. We caught nine bursts with the VLA in that observing session. Very gratifying, all at the same dispersion measure, all at the exact same position. We know we, we had nailed it. We got a precise sky position. And that allowed us to then go and beg for time at an optical telescope. So this is how the chain of events. Then you go to your friends at the optical telescope. This was the uh, Gemini telescope in Hawaii. And we said, hey, can we borrow your telescope? We finally got a position for a fast radio burst. And they said, uh, sure. And here, we didn't have to rely on the source bursting. We just wanted to see if there's a galaxy at that position. And sure enough, this is the optical image. Uh, and, and I have to say, um, we were a little underwhelmed. We were. We were expecting a nice, honking, lovely spiral galaxy or something interesting, and instead, it's this puny little nothing galaxy. Uh, it's incredibly faint. Uh, they call it a dwarf galaxy, and here's where, they, I, oh my goodness, uh, there's all sorts of different types of galaxies. Who knew? Uh, it's, it's in a very, very tiny little galaxy. Uh, and this is work done by uh, Miguel Postoc, uh, Srihar uh, Tendulkar. But what we could learn from that tiny little nothing galaxy, this dwarf galaxy, is uh, you, we have ways uh, using spectroscopy, os optical spectroscopy, of determining the distance. And we could, this is the first time that independent of the dispersion argument and the free electrons, the, all that argument about this, the galaxy and the contour plot, all that, which led us to believe they had to be far away, finally we could check. We could check, and indeed, this galaxy is, um, is uh, at a, a cosmological distance. It is extremely far away, and we were, that was very gratifying. And this generated all sorts of press. So uh, you know, USA Today, LA Times, uh, Fox, uh, so everybody was reporting on this. Uh, the monster burst of radio waves arose in a tiny galaxy. Surprise, it was a surprise. We were really shocked. Um, the New York Times did a little graphic where the famous science writer Dennis Overby wrote, radio bursts trace to faraway galaxy, but caller is probably ordinary physics. <laughs> now, I have to admit, I didn't like that too much. I feel like I'd like to, to bring an FRB to his home late at night in the dark and explode it and see how ordinary he finds that. Um, but uh, on the other hand, curiously, the New York Post, scientists say radio signals from deep space could be aliens? Like, <laughs> Like, we never said that. Why? We didn't say that. <laughs> Interesting. In any case, where do we stand? Um, we know at least one FRB repeats. We have, uh, so that rules out exploding or colliding stars, at least for that source. And we were able to confirm that they are indeed at cosmological distances, or at least this source is definitely as far away as we had inferred from the dispersion. But what we still don't know is, do all fast radio bursts repeat? We don't know. Is this the, it's probably not the only one that repeats. Are there two classes? Do some repeat and others don't? We, our Parks colleagues keep looking. Nobody has seen another repeat from any other source. Uh, what is the bursting source? We don't know what it is, and why is it in that tiny galaxy? And so this is what, we, we don't know the answers to these questions, we're working on it, and so how do you go about solving this? You know, you, and and I, I really wonder, like I, I'm really curious what these things are, and so how do you solve a problem like this? It's very hard when you have a regular radio telescope and you can only look at a tiny region of the sky. You know, if it's a transient source population where it's going off and you don't know where the next one's gonna be, the only way to solve that is to look everywhere at the same time. 
which is, of course, not very easy, especially when you're looking for these short events and you have to correct for this dispersion. It's, it's very hard. But the only way to solve this problem is to find more. And so for the last part of the talk, I want to very quickly tell you about a new telescope that we're building in Canada called CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. Um, this is in Penticton, British Columbia, and this is a picture of it. It exists, um, and that might not look like a radio telescope to you, but, but it is. So this is a different ge geometry for radio telescope. Uh, first of all, just the dimensions here. These are four cylinders, or four half pipes, four half pipes uh, that are, the length here is 100 meters, 100 meters by 20 meters. So this is 80 meters by 100 meters. That's the area in Canadian units of five hockey arenas. Uh, I have to, I hate doing that to Canada. Like, we're not just about hockey, okay? We're all, anyway, but I do love, I'm a big, big Montreal Canadiens fan. Um, in any case, so it's four 20 meter by 100 meter cylinders. They're, they have no, there's no moving parts here. You can't steer this thing. Uh, it, it sees exactly what is overhead. These are oriented exactly north-south, so the sky rotates overhead as the Earth turns. So we get to see only what's overhead. Uh, it's operating at a frequency range of 400 to 800 megahertz, and what's happening here, the way this works is that a cylinder, so a dish focuses to a point. So at Arecibo or at Parks, you put an antenna at the focus of the dish. A cylinder, on the other hand, focuses to a line. And so we have populated uh, these focal lines. Uh, each, each cylinder has 256 antennas hanging from it. And these are all, uh, each, uh, each of these, uh, there's, each antenna has two polarizations, uh, two, two cables coming out, and they're all uh, going into effectively a massive supercomputer that is collecting all of the data from all of these 1,024 antennas simultaneously. Um, and the input data rate that we're talking about here is 13 terabits, it should be terabits per second. So the total amount of data that's being collected from all these antennas is equivalent, roughly speaking, to the world's entire, entire cellular network. Uh, and all the supercomputing, some of it is sitting in houses that are, you can't quite see that are under the dishes, but these are also sitting in these specially outfitted shipping containers that are on the side here. There's massive supercomputing going on, uh, crunching all the data from these antennas. This is a project that is a collaboration between McGill University, University of Toronto, and University of British Columbia. And the original design here for this telescope was actually driven by a totally different project. It's meant to do cosmology uh, and study uh, hydrogen gas in the distant universe. Uh, and it's my cosmologist colleagues who came up with this interesting design for a telescope. And later we realized this would be great for studying fast radio bursts. And, and uh, let me explain, explain uh, why. And just first, um, a little bit more about the telescope. They're just for scale. You can see uh, part of the team standing in the, in, the, in the axis of the cylinder. And here is, uh, just to give you a scale of the region around there in, in Penticton, near Penticton, British Columbia. This is a drone, so it's a drone view of, of the cylinders. Um, you can see here in front the shipping containers uh, and the, the four, um, four axes from above. There, the, the attitude is slightly changed for the drone. I was really hoping that uh, the person videoing it would come and then it would swoop down the axes like, you know, it's, Star Wars, it doesn't, he, he, he wasn't that silly, that would be really dangerous, you didn't want to do that, but um, you can get a, a feeling for the scale of, uh, of the telescope from this, uh, this lovely video. Um, but now, why is this really good for transient? So let me be clear here. If this is the Parkes telescope, the Parkes telescope sees a tiny region of the sky. Uh, and for a transient source population, you, you have to get lucky. I mean, they, they, get, they find a few bursts. They found 30 in the last decade, uh, or 29, you know, something like 29, a couple dozen in the last decade. But they miss most of the ones in the sky because they have a tiny field of view. On the other hand, um, when you have a cylinder, the cylinder focuses uh, the light from a much larger region of the sky, from a whole line on the sky. And so, um, Compare the field of view of the Parkes telescope to the Chine telescope, 
Uh, and what you see is, you know, it's, 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 it's a no-brainer. If you want to study a transient population, you need a large field of view. And so the way this works is the sky rotates overhead, and we can see a larger fraction of the sky. We still don't see the full sky, but we can see a much larger fraction of the sky with chime, and so we're gonna catch a lot more fast radio bursts. And we think we can catch a few to a few dozen per day using chime. And that will allow us, you know, if we have 30 in the last decade, once we turn this on in the first week or two, we'll have as many as we've had in the last decade. And that's why we're so excited about chime, not just for the wonderful cosmology that it's going to do, uh, but also for the transient um, uh, project. We had our first light ceremony in September 2017 at Chime with our Canadian Minister of Science, uh, Kirsty, Kirsty Duncan. She, she came uh, out to Penticton, and, and you could see some of the antennas there. She hoisted the last cassette of antennas and snapped it into place, and then Chime magically turned on. Uh, we, uh, this, is, this is first light data. So this is some data from Chime, and uh, this is now showing you, um, you might see, that, that doesn't look like much data there, Vicky, what, what are you talking about? And uh, well, this is time on the x-axis, and this is now dispersion on the y-axis, dispersion measure, and actually what you can see, if you look really carefully, down there at really low dispersion measures, you can see pulses, and that's a pulsar in our galaxy, so at a very low dispersion measure, because it's in our galaxy, and you can see little pulses of radio waves, that's the sort of signal we hope to be able to see at, uh, at much higher um, dispersion measure, albeit they don't seem to repeat very often. Uh, I'll skip that. I just want to say that the Chime Telescope Project, uh, this is really built and, and, uh, uh, and uh, being commissioned now um, mainly by students, students and postdocs. This is, we have a few engineers working on the project, but uh, it's very much a student project. Uh, we're, we're, it's a very large, complex instrument, but you can see here this is PhD student Ziggy Plonis from, from um, McGill. We, he and I spent two weeks plugging in cables, basically. Uh, and you can see uh, from UBC, this is Mei Ling Deng, who, um, who designed the different types of antennas. And you can see uh, also from UBC uh, uh, project manager, Mandana Miri, and uh, all sorts of people who are uh, working on this project together. Uh, and we're very excited. It's, it, we're not quite there. We haven't yet detected fast radio bursts, but we're commissioning the telescope right now. Uh, and we're quite excited because in Nature, in January, they wrote, what are the big top science things to expect in 2018? And uh, frighteningly, they put the Chime telescope uh, as one of the first items, and that's like no pressure on us, none, none whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but uh, in any case, I say to you, uh, Chime, the Fast Radio Perth Project, stay tuned. And in a couple of years, we might actually have, uh, have learned uh, more and understood a lot more about these uh, fast radio bursts. And I'll stop there and thank um, our sources of uh, funding in Canada for this, uh, for this project. And I thank you very much for your attention. So as promised, um, Vicki will take questions from the audience. We have, there should be microphones. There's a microphone over there. Where's this, and this microphone back there. So just raise your hand and a microphone will come to you and then you can ask the question. There's a couple up front here. I can direct if the microphones don't see you. How far? How far was that source for the repeating FRB? I don't think you said how. I didn't say the number, but so it's a gigaparsec. So it, uh, it's something like three billion light years. Three billion, thank you. Far, yeah, so it's an appreciable fraction of the size of the universe. And for those who know about these things, there's a redshift of 0.2. I think there was a this, uh, little girl there, yeah. I'd be sure. About Chime, wasn't it really a circle slash cylinder, or was it a parabola or hyperbola? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's uh, in one, it's a long line in one direction, and the shape in this direction is a, is is like a parabola. Yeah, cylindrical paraboloid. 
Another question about Chime. Uh, you said your downloading data is 16 terabits per second. Yeah, thir 13 terabits per second, yes. How are you storing the data and like how long is it being stored for? Yeah, so we can't store all that data. So that's why we have the, the computers there to, to, to crunch it. So it, it gets, um, uh, there's a bank of um, GPUs uh, in one of those shipping containers and that crunches the data uh, so that we are effectively, so for, my, for the project that I'm working on, the Fast Radio Burst project, we get data um, uh, every millisecond in 16,000 frequency channels. Uh, so that's about 142 gigabits per second. So online, so that 13 terabits per second in real time gets crunched to 142 gigabits per second for us. The cosmology um, data rate is, is lower than that, actually. So a lot of the computing has to be done at the site and it uh, um, takes a lot of power at the site. Uh, your uh, Chime uh, telescope, you got 400 to 800 megahertz. That's lower than what you've been seeing before. Why is that just a result of... Uh, yeah, so, you're, so, so the FRBs I mentioned before were all at 1.4 gigahertz and we're at 400 to 800. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, as I said, the telescope was designed to do cosmology of redshifted hydrogen. And so hi, the hydrogen emits a, uh, a line at, at 1,400 megahertz. But if you want to study redshifted hydrogen, that, that is hydrogen that's moving away from you due to the expansion of the universe, then the, that line appears um, at a lower radio frequency. And so 400 to 800 megahertz, the cosmologists chose that range because that corresponds to a distance in the universe where the, ex where the expansion of the universe is, uh, is accelerating. And it's a particularly interesting um, choice uh, for, for doing cosmology and studying dark energy. For us, I mean, they were building the telescope anyway, and so um, there is a little bit of concern that the fast radio burst phenomenon, how do we know that you'll detect it? We'll detect it between 400 and 800 megahertz when it's been seen mainly at 1400 megahertz. And uh, there are several now fast radio bursts who have, that have been seen between 700 and 800 megahertz using um, different telescopes that I didn't have time to mention. So we know that at least in the top part of the Chime band, they exist. But at frequencies lower than 700 megahertz, we don't actually know if they're there. And so on the one hand, it's a bit of a risk, but, it's, but, but the telescope was gonna be built anyway. We had no say. We, we took, took what we got. And um, I also think because we know that they exist between 700 and 800, it's also quite an interesting range to see what happens below that. So our best estimates, when I say between a few and, and a few dozen per day, are trying to account as best we can for what we think the frequency behavior of them is, but we don't know for sure. Is there any plan to have two uh, sites make the measurement? You mean to do... Uh, uh, Simultaneously, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we would love to do that. And, and so you, you're saying that because you realize that if you could do it simultaneously, then you could get a, a position very precisely. I assume that's why you're asking that. So to do interferometry using the two telescopes, you could get a very precise position. So one thing Chime cannot get us alone is a position good enough to go and see if there's a galaxy there. So we might detect a thousand fast radio bursts, but we won't know what galaxies are there unless some of them repeat and then we go to an interferometer. But if we could do it in real time and have multiple Chimes, we could do that, uh, and we're talking about it. I mean, there's no, there's no reason you couldn't do this. It's just money. Uh, <laughs> but if you could, it would be great, because you'd have the positions for all of them just like that, and even the ones that don't repeat. So if there's really two different classes, you'd love to be able to do that. Um, you mentioned that other radio telescopes focus to a point, whereas Chime is more of a line. Um, is that going to inhibit your ability to determine where it is in the sky? Yeah, that's a great question. So let me show you something. I was hoping somebody would ask that question. Um, so, <laughs> I happen to have a slide. We're all prepared for this. Uh, so if you put a single antenna on one 
cylinder. And so this is a representation of the sky and uh, the, the horizon, okay, is the light part of the sky. And you can see basically uh, a whole region north-south. And you can't tell where the, so if you detect a fast radio burst, all you know is that it's somewhere in that strip. You don't know where in that strip. But then if you put many antennas along that line and you uh, put them into a correlator, so basically what you're effectively saying, seeing is the slight time delay between the different antennas. If the, if the source is over here, then it hits this one first, and then this one, then this one, this one. And so you basically combine the signals of the antennas um, using a computer, and you look, it's as if you're looking for the correct delay that lines them all up. That pinpoints it on the sky, at least in the north-south direction. So you can say in which of these beams this, the event arose. And then if you put antennas on all of the cylinders, you can get information on the east-west direction as well. So, but this requires the, su the supercomputing. So, so basically what Chime is doing um, is uh, the, the number crunching on site is providing us this stream of data at every millisecond for a thousand different beams on the sky. So it's like we have a thousand Parkes telescopes all at the same time, and we're searching a thousand Parkes telescopes for fast radio bursts at the same time. So this is why it's, it's, a, it's challenging. Are the aliens giving the signals? Oh, that's a great question, and I get, you know, I get that question so often. Um, no, I feel very confident that this is not aliens, and although it's a very reasonable question to ask, but um, we see these sources all over the sky and from, uh, as, as we believe, very different distances. There's no, the technology you would need to produce a, a signal like this, um, maybe somebody could invent something like this, but they couldn't talk to somebody on the other side of the universe and explain to them how to do it. So the fact that you see it all over the sky uh, tells us that this can't be something, it has to be something natural. It has to be a natural phenomenon. There's no way that those parts of the universe know about each other and communicate. So no, we do not believe these are aliens. Hi, I was wondering uh, why you are focused uh, only on ground-based telescopes and if there was any ideas of using something like LISA if it ever gets created ah, yeah. to really see on the larger scales. Right. So um, we're very fortunate that radio waves can get through our atmosphere. And so, for example, we don't need to, there's, n there's no blurring at these frequencies of, of the atmosphere. So, for example, you, use, you need the Hubble Space Telescope to be above the atmosphere to get rid of the atmospheric blurring, or x-rays don't get through. So you need an x-ray telescope to be in orbit. Um, so for something like uh, LISA, which is sensitive to gravitational waves, um, you can also do that on the ground, and that's what the adva advanced LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory, does from the ground. LISA will do it um, uh, extremely well, as you're saying, uh, from space, um, but in a different frequency band, different frequency band of gravitational waves. But you're raising a very important point that, um, let's say fast radio bursts Let's say there's two classes. There's the repeaters and there's non-repeaters. The non-repeaters could be colliding neutron stars. Colliding neutron stars produce gravitational waves that could be detected by a gravitational wave observatory. And that's the sort of thing that Chime could discover. And the problem is that um, you don't know when that's going to happen either. So having a large field of view makes it easier. It gives you a better chance to detect something like that. Uh, but we don't need to go to space for the radio waves because they get through the atmosphere. So uh, thank you for sharing your research. It's fascinating. You've talked thank about you. what it's not, but do you have any hypotheses about <laughs> what is causing them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, well... I'll say uh, the repeater, in, so, so separate the repeater out. The repeater, uh, it's, it smells a little bit like a neutron star in that we know of neutron stars in our galaxy that produce bursts 
albeit not in, in radio waves. They produce X-ray and gamma ray bursts. They're called magnetars. Uh, very highly magnetized neutron stars, uh, their magnetic fields are unstable and they can lead to massive explosions and we see that in our galaxy. Some of them do produce some radio waves, uh, but the fast radio bursts are way, like a billion times brighter. So on the one, and in principle a magnetar could have that kind, enough energy to do it, but only for so long. So we've now detected hundreds of bursts, each of which is really energetic. And so you can ca do a calculation. A magnetar with the, what we know about them could do this, you know, maybe for 100 years. And uh, we've only observed this one for three or four years, but it will have to start petering out soon if, it's if that's gonna work. Um, now 100 years is a long time, and maybe we've just caught it at the beginning. But if it's somewhere in the middle of its lifetime, as is most likely, then it should eventually be slowing down. But the, the ones that don't repeat, or at least haven't yet been observed to repeat, um, this, I, I really am pretty agnostic. I, I don't have, uh, you know, magnetars could do it, but things falling into black holes uh, could also potentially do it. So I don't have a, a favorite one for those. Thank you. Those false signals from Australia during the lunch hour, yeah. polytrons or whatever they were called. Peritons, yeah. Do those display the di dispersion characteristic? Yes, and, and it's a very, you, you, could, you could easily, you could ask, well, why would a microwave oven do that? But doesn't that kind of blow out, I mean, don't you have any other way of determining that they're so far away other than that dispersion characteristic? Um, so, so, um, so, so the first question, so, so number one, you know, the microwave oven does it for some reason. And um, why they do it, we don't know. Uh, and you're saying, doesn't that call into question any dispersion? Um, except that in our galaxy, we observe thousands of, of these radio pulsars that Evan mentioned that produce regular pulsations of radio waves. And, and we, we know them all over the sky. Um, and they all have this dispersion characteristic. So in our own galaxy, we, we know this effect exists. We've, we can confirm the distances that they imply. Uh, and so it's, it's very well established. Uh, the effect of cold plasma, plasma dispersion is, is known. It's in electromagnetic textbooks. It's, it's not a surprise to us at all. The only surprising things for fast radio bursts is the degree of the dispersion is so much larger uh, than what can be from the galaxy. Um, I, <laughs> I would love to answer all the questions. This, uh, Okay. Um, hi, interesting talk. Thank um, you. Is there any way, or do you know what the mass of that small galaxy is and how it might compare to the mass of other larger galaxies? Yeah, it's, it's a very small, like a, a percent of the uh, size of the Milky Way galaxy, for example. So, so there's it's, no super massive black holes sitting in the middle. Ah, well that's actually a really interesting question because we do believe that there's massive black holes at the centers of every galaxy. And so, so as I now venture into the field of, of galaxies, which is new for me. I mean, I, I've lived my whole life inside this galaxy, so I know a lot about our galaxy, but now I, so it turns out we don't really, um, and I think there's, there's people I know um, from uh, astronomy um, group here that study these tiny little, little galaxies, and it's unclear if they have supermassive black holes in them. So this is an open question for, for uh, dwarf galaxies. Do all have, massive black holes, or, or do any have massive black holes? It, it's actually not clear. So, and and um, for those of you who've been to the Southern Hemisphere, you might be familiar with the Magellanic Clouds, which are neighboring uh, dwarf galaxies to the Milky Way galaxy. Lovely, easy, easy to see in the night sky in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, we don't know if they have massive black holes. Um, a colleague of mine at McGill is trying to uh, actually um, answer that question. Darryl, Dar Professor Darrell Haggard is working exactly on that question. So. Yeah, we don't know. It's okay. an interesting question. I had a quick question. Do, do the FRBs, particularly the repeating ones, were they predicted by any theoretical work? Absolutely not. If, do, they, do they discredit any theoretical work? Well, they don't, 
They, no, they, they don't discredit. Uh, uh, basically, it was a phenomenon that was found by accident. Um, the, my colleagues in Australia were searching for radio pulsars in our own galaxy and um, just happened to set the upper limit on the dispersion measure to which they searched to something ridiculously high, not thinking they'd find anything, but computationally it's actually easy to search. It's a very high dispersion measure. And then they found one. And, they, and so it, the repeater ruled out, at least for that source, a whole bunch of classes of models, but it didn't really, it didn't really discredit anything, no. Okay, is there any uh, periodicity or other patterns in the distribution over time of this burst? <laughs> yes, so if it's a neutron star, you would expect that the repeater's bursts would come periodically because repetitions in a neutron star correspond to the rotation. And we've been looking for that, and no. And even sometimes we've detected, you know, 10 bursts in half an hour. And the first thing we do is look for a periodicity. They don't seem periodic. And that, so that's another, that's one reason, uh, you know, could it be a neutron star? Well, if we found repetition, it, periodic repetition, huh, that would be so neutron star, that would be it. But um, it, it's not. Does that rule out a neutron star? Not really. So the questions are fantastic, so I hate to cut them off. Well, let's do two more questions, one for each microphone, and, and then we'll uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you. Um, so Chime will give us, if, it, if it's successful, it'll give us a lot more examples. What's your strategy in terms of, of how that will potentially lead to understanding the source of these? It lead to what, sorry? How, what's your strategy for using that to help uh, get to the source? Right. So with Chime, we're, we're hoping um, to detect, you know, a thousand odd, you know, per year at least. And so first of all, you can ask questions like, are they isotropic on the sky? So if they're a cosmological population, they better be isotropic. And so far, the 30 odd are roughly isotropic. There's some hint that they avoid the plane of the galaxy, but that could be just because there's a lot of plasma in the plane of the, plane of the galaxy, and that can have effects on their detection. So you could ask that, or you could ask what is their distribution of, of intensities? How, how bright are they? And uh, or you could ask, once you have a large statistical sample, you could say, do the ones with the highest dispersion measures, are they the faintest ones? Because maybe they're the furthest ones away. So you could start to answer population questions like that. But because Chime searches for fast radio bursts 24 seven and the sky keeps coming back, we can also identify repeaters very easily. So we're also hoping that we'll pick out all the repeaters and then we can localize those using an interferometer We'll have to totally take over the VLA to do this. It's a problem. <laughs> um, we, need, we need a dedicated VLA to do this, which is why I think we might, we need multiple chimes. But um, then you can localize them, and do they all come from dwarf galaxies? Or maybe we'll find only repeaters are in dwarf galaxies. So once you have a large population to work with, there's many ways to get at the problem. None guaranteed to work, to answer it but at least we'll know a lot more. Um, regarding the repeating uh, fast radio bursts, like the one where you get 10 within a half an hour session, is it possible that something like gravi extreme gravitational lensing in the same form as like Einstein's cross has kind of multiplied the signals, or has that been ruled yeah. out? So actually, the, um, that's a really, really interesting question. So. We don't think that it is um, uh, a necessarily gravitational lensing. Currently, the best hypothesis for those, or one hypothesis, is that there's something called plasma lensing going on. So um, if you look at the different bursts, even, and, and I, I did, actually, I think I showed, it might not have been so obvious, but if you look at um, the series of 10 bursts we discovered that day at Arecibo, each one's a little different. Um, and they have different frequency structures. Some were brighter at the top part of the band, some were dimmer at the top part of the band. They looked a little different. And there are some models being developed by colleagues of mine, um, Jim Cortez at Cornell University, for example, that try to explain um, the different behaviors and some of the repetition 
by being lenses of plasma um, around the source. And um, it's a very interesting, interesting hypothesis, but yet, yet to be proven. Okay. I, I, there's several thank yous to make. First of all, thank you to all of you for coming out tonight and sharing this with us. I um, really appreciate your support. Uh, there are various people who have uh, made this all possible. Uh, Catherine Lindsay, Kate Hackathorn, uh, Sharon uh, Weir, a uh, number of other people I'm not mentioning, that, but they all came together and contributed. And uh, it's, But again, you're the most uh, important part of this, and I think it would be a perfect time to thank Vicki for an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you.